really quick, this morning as I was preparing for our gathering, I really felt impressed with the Lord uh, to pray for miracles today. Everybody say miracles. And so here's what I want to say. Church Alive is in a miraculous season. And as the church walks into, into and through this miraculous season, it would be normal to expect that there would be miracles that would happen in your life uh, as that happens, and that would be reciprocal here in our church. So here's what I want to do this morning. Uh, I want you to think about your life right now. Some of you are in need of a miracle, and some of you need a miracle and aren't even aware of it. You're, you're not, you are so consumed with where you are, you can't even think about the miracle. You're just trying to survive. You're just trying uh, to dig out of that. Uh, I want to pray for you today. If you need a miracle of any kind, it does not matter what it is. And you may go, well, mine's irrelevant. There is no miracle that is irrelevant. I'm telling you, that's how the enemy works. Well, you, should not, you shouldn't pray about that. Yes, you should. Uh, I believe strongly. If you need a miracle right now, I want you to stand to your feet. All over this room, you are in need of a miracle. Look at this. All over this room right now, we're going to pray. Yes, I see it. Uh, how many of you uh, that are standing and seated have ever had a miracle in your life? Let me see your hand. Yes. All right. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to do the church thing right now. I want you to grab the hand of the person beside you, uh, whether they're sitting or standing, and we're going to pray. Somebody's going to be praying for you for a miracle, and you're going to be praying for somebody for a miracle. Here we go. We're going to do this right now. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I want you to pray out loud. Go ahead. Begin to pray for the person beside you. God, I ask for miracles in this house. We are in a miraculous season in our church, God, and I believe uh, in profoundly in the miraculous. And so, Lord, I'm praying for every person in this room that has stood right now that needs a miracle, whether it's physical, emotional, financial, career, family, uh, forgiveness whatever it is, God. I'm asking you to do the miraculous. We believe in that, God. I believe in the power of the miraculous. And I'm asking you right now in this moment, at this time, for miracles and continue to mantle church alive uh, for the miraculous and to be a place of miracles. We speak this forth right now in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's give the Lord praise. Come on now. Let's give him praise. Amen. Here's what you can be seated. Here's what I want you to do. Find me on the website and, and uh, email me or go to that Facebook thing. I don't like that messenger thing, but you can message me on that thing. Uh, and tell me, Pastor, God has answered a prayer. I want to know. I don't want you to keep it to yourself. I want to know. I am like nosy. I want to know that God has done this in your life. And the one thing that you need to do and I need to do is we need to point all praise and all glory to God. Amen. Now, when I was a younger child, I wanted to go to heaven to escape hell. Mm -hmm. That was my sole motivation for going to heaven because I saw a trilogy of movies about Jesus coming back. To this day, I remember them, uh, Burning Hell. Uh, one of them was called, Bur I'll never forget the one called Burning Hell. I was like, ah, I'm going to hell every day. Uh, you know, I was scared to death. And, uh, and so my motivation for going to heaven was to escape hell. Now, how many of you know that's an admirable uh, motivation to go to heaven? Yes, because we do not want to go to hell, right? But then as I've gotten older in my journey, notice I said older, not old, but older in my journey with Jesus, I actually can't wait to go to heaven to spend time with God. Now, those are completely opposite, and the motivations are not one and the same. We used to sing a song when I was growing up. We sang it this morning. How about Steve on the banjo? Come on, somebody. Oh, yeah. Man, that tapped into, Greg Penny, I know you were on that. That tapped into my inner bluegrass. I love bluegrass music, by the way. Uh, and so I don't care what you think about that. I don't care if you think I'm old. I love me some good bluegrass. And so when he broke that banjo out, I'm about to go eastern North Carolina up in here uh, on somebody, uh, or western North Carolina, whichever the case may be, on that. But we used to sing that song, I'll Fly Away. Do you know that I'll Fly Away is the most recorded gospel song of all time? It has been recorded uh, in various forms at least 5,000 times. There, there could be 5,000 variations of the song. It was actually written by a man named Albert Brumley, who is from, was born in Spiro, Oklahoma. Now, is anybody in here from Oklahoma? All the way in the back. Do you know where Spiro is? 
She does. Okay. Never heard of it. That's like asking somebody from Oklahoma, have you ever heard of Fuquay Varina, North Carolina, right? They'll say no, but you ask them if they heard from Raleigh, they'll say yeah. 5,000 different variations. He grew up, Albert grew up in a very poor, impoverished home. And by the age of five, he was working in the cotton fields of Oklahoma just to come alongside of his family uh, to have enough money to eat. Also, when he was five, one of his brothers... Uh, contracted typhoid fever and died. Just a very quick death. Uh, Back in the early 1900s, if you got any kind of sickness like that, there was no medicine to treat you, and you were usually gone pretty rapidly. And so he, he grew up with a lot of heartache, a lot of hardship, he actually made his way to college. And so uh, I'm interested in the rest of the story because I like success and I like uh, learning about people that, uh, that don't allow their temporary circumstances to control their destiny. And that's another sermon for another day. But too many maybe in this room are allowing your temporary limitations and circumstances to actually dictate your destiny. And that should not be. Can somebody say amen? And so while he was in college... He wrote uh, the words down, but God gave him the words of this song uh, when he was a young boy. Some glad morning when this life is o'er, I'll fly away. Y'all going to sing with me? (laughs) To a home on God's celestial shore, I'll fly away. away, Here he comes. I feel Eastern coming on. When I die, hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away. When the shadows of this life have flown, I groan, fly away. Like a bird from prison bars has flown, I'll fly away. Here we go, sing it with me. I hear you, Tanya Davis. Come on. When I die, hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away. Here we go. Just a few more weary days and then I'll fly away. To a land where joy shall never end, I'll fly away. One more time. I've always wanted to direct the choir. Nobody said in the morning. I'll fly away. Now listen, you're going to be singing that song all day because somebody texted me last week. Pastor Glenn, I cannot stop singing. What a friend we have in Jesus. Because they, they have that rhythm and they have that that gets down in your soul. Obviously today I'm going to talk about the second coming of Jesus. I love talking about the second coming of Jesus. Uh, let's talk about his return. Everybody say return. John 13, 33. We'll spend a little time in John 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. You should really go read it for yourself because Jesus prophesies that he is actually leaving. And he starts out here in John 13, 33. My children, I will be with you only a little longer. And as I'm reading this to you, here's here's what I want to give you this thought. I think we should live with a hope for tomorrow with an urgency for today. This is, this is the goal of this, that I would live with the incredible hope for tomorrow, but I will not forget about the urgency of today. My children, I will be with you no longer, a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. So all of a sudden, listen, I score uh, high seven, high eight. Uh, on the Enneagram, I'm like high optimist and have no problem being in charge. So that's kind of uh, who I am. But, but my high optimist goes here. I'm like, wait a minute. I don't see any hope in this. I cannot find the hope in this right here. Jesus says, children, I love you. I'm leaving. And where I'm going, you can't go. Oh, my goodness, that sounds hopeless. Then you slip over to 14, 1. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go, and we know he's going because he just told us he was. 
And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back. Now my seven's going, woo! Hallelujah! I got to the hope part. Everybody say hope. Hmm. I'm going to come back and take you to be with me that you may also be where I am. You know the, play, the way to the place where I am going. So now Jesus goes a little further. He says, I'm going. You can't come with me, but don't worry. I'm coming back because I'm preparing a place for you. And when I come back, I am going to take you to be with me in this place forever. Now, if you skip over to John 14, 16, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. So this is huge. I'm leaving. You can't go with me initially. I'm coming back. And when I come back, I'm going to take you to be with me. But in the meantime, everybody say in the meantime. And this is how we live with an urgency for today. I am asking the Father to give you another counselor. Everybody say counselor. In the context of this scripture, this counselor is the Holy Spirit. And I want to say this to you, contrary to what most many will say or even may believe, I believe the Holy Spirit's presence, activity, infilling, gifts of the Spirit, they will all increase preceding the return of Jesus, not digress. I do not believe the Spirit's off under some rock somewhere uh, shaking uh, at everything that is going on in our culture. I believe the Spirit uh, is seeking those whose hearts are inclined to God and filling. Everybody say filling. So he says, I'm not going to leave you uh, behind or I'm not going to leave you as, a, uh, as an orphan uh, because God does not make us orphans. I'm going to ask the Father and he's going to send the Spirit to you during this in-between time. Now, how many of you know that's hope? Yeah. Everybody say hope. hope. Mm. Skip over to 17 verse 24. Father, I love that. Now, this is, I'm like, I'm like so on this right now, but, but my personality type is I'm like in this now. Father, I want those you have given uh, me to be with me. Oh my goodness, Jesus wants me to be with him. It's not like he's having to figure it out or if he really likes me or not. He likes me a whole lot. He likes you a whole lot. He loves you a whole lot. He wants you to be with him. Isn't that amazing? It's not like uh, sometimes we wonder if somebody really likes us or not. I think we spend way too much time uh, throughout our life trying to get people to like us. Some are going to like you, some are not going to like you. It's just the way that it is. Can somebody say amen? Father, I want those who have given, you have given me to be with me where I am. Woo, I love it. And to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. So there is hope today in the return of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now let's talk about an aspect, another aspect of the second coming called the rapture. Everybody say rapture. rapture. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. Brothers, this is Paul to the Thessalonians. Notice the language that he used. Brothers, family. Everybody say family. family. We do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep. Everybody say, fall asleep. fall asleep. This is another uh, phrase for died. Those who have died. They are no longer in your presence, but they are somewhere. So hold on. You got to watch this. Or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. Woo! Now, Paul is not saying you should not feel grief or you should not grieve for those whom you love that die. How many of you have had someone that you love dearly and they have passed from this earthly life? Let me see your hand. I mean, in order to grieve, you must first love. You will not grieve for someone that you have not loved. You might have a tear and you might feel sad, but grief is way down in your soul. It's way down in the depth of your being. That can only come because you have loved somebody. He says, I want you to not be like those who have no hope and grieve as if it is over and the end. Listen to me, here's what he said. We believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus 
those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive. Now notice Paul's language here. Paul, very smart, intellectual, maybe one of the smartest people, for sure, uh, believers of his time, uh, fully believed that he would be alive when Jesus returned. It's in the language of, of the way. And we who are still alive, Paul wrote this when he was alive. He did not write this when he was dead. We who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven. Sounds like a science fiction movie, by the way. I'm not joking with you. Come down from heaven with a loud command. With the voice of the archangel. I want you to hold that thought, archangel, right there. I'm going to talk to you about that in just a second. And with the trumpet call of God. So I, I, you, need, you need to get the picture here. Jesus is not tiptoeing down from heaven, the stairway that leads from earth to heaven. He is not tiptoeing down the stairway and trying to come silently and quietly. Oh, no. There's going to be a lot of noise attached. I'm not sure if unbelievers will hear the noise or not, but they are going to see the evidences of something supernatural. And so here's what he says. With the voice of the archangel and the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. We used to sing another song. Uh, i got to hurry up because I went really long in the first gathering. I want to tr- preach for three hours, but I can't, so I have to condense it all into one. There is going to be a meeting in the air in the sweet, sweet by and by. Y'all know that song? How many of you know it? I am going to, how many of you know it? <laughs> Praise God, my wife is younger than me. Yes, hello. Where was I at? There is going to be a meeting in the air, in the sweet, sweet by and by. I am going to meet you, meet you over there in that land beyond the skies. Such singing they were here, never heard by my, oh, wait a minute, I got carried away. Yes, we'll be glorious, I do declare. And God's own son will be the leading one at the meeting in the air. Greg Penny, you know that song, don't you? No, yes. There's going to be a meeting in the air. I want to talk about that in a minute. Let's talk about the rapture. Paul says we are not to worry about those who have fallen asleep. Everybody say worry. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. Therefore, we are always confident. Now, where does our confidence come from? It comes from our faith. How can your faith make you confident except that your faith is in the truth? Everybody say truth. If your faith is not in the truth, you will not have this confidence. Therefore, we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. Now, I want to ask you right now, how many of you are at home in your body right now? I'm going to ask you again. (laughs) This is not a trick question. How many of you are at home in your body right now? You are. Mm -hmm. Now, you don't get to choose your genetically inclined tent. That's been chosen for you by those that came before you. But inside of your body is your soul. Everybody say soul. It's your soul that as long as it is attached to your body and in your body, and it will be until one of two things happens. Either you die or Jesus returns, okay? Your soul is residing in your body. So I can't go to my brother right here and say, I want to take up residence in your body. Uh Uh-uh. This is who I am to you. This is who I am because you see my body moving. But my body does not think for me. My body does what the passions of my soul tell it to do. 
Listen to me. One day. So to be present in my body means I only experience God at a certain level. I cannot experience him in fullness yet. But this is where the Spirit is necessary in my life because the Spirit is the Spirit of God and th therefore will awaken me to the things of God, the mysteries of God. But I won't know the fullness of God until I am absent from my body. But listen, here's what he said. We live by faith and not sight. We are confident, I say, and would, be, would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So he said, it's good for you to be alive, but the preference is that you would be alive outside of your body and with the Lord. I told you this sounds like science fiction and, uh, and way out there, but I'm telling you, listen to me. So Paul says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Are you with me today, church? And so he says... The thing that you are most afraid of, which is death, I want to tell you today, death is not the final answer. Death is not the final moment. It's actually, and I'll never forget the day that I walked up to my mom's casket. It was in a little country church that would sing, I'll fly away and meeting in the air and keep on the firing line. Now, if you've really been saved a long time, you know that song, but I'll spare you that one. I walked up to the casket of my mom for the first time after they had uh, done what they do at the, the funeral. How many of you are morticians? Anybody a mortician in the house? I always wonder about them. Hmm. What do they do for fun? I'm so glad God did not call me to mortician. Is somebody's got to do it. I also think these. What if somebody came alive one time in there? What? <laughs> Wait a minute! I'd love to be there for that. I walked up to my mom's casket. She's laying there, and the first thing, my mom suffered. I looked at her, and as if the Lord says, "She's not there," and I felt every hair on my body coming alive, and I'm like, she's not there. This is just a, a shell. This is where she was, and it was as clear as day to me. She's not there. And you know what? That it, The Lord took me to the scripture in 2 Corinthians uh, 5, 8, that to be absent from the body is to be uh, present with the Lord. If you're a believer, you have a lot of hope. Are y'all with me? Say amen. So according to Paul, we immediately go into the presence of the Lord. Let me tell you about your soul. Your soul does not sleep. Your body sleeps. Listen, if they go exhume a body because they need DNA on a body or whatever. Now I've watched too many of these crime shows. But if they go exhume that body, they're not finding that soul in there. There is absolutely nothing to be worried about. They're just opening up and there's skeleton and some decaying flesh and some stank on there. But at the end of the day, what resided in that body is no more. Listen. It also goes to reason that a body is not alive until a body has a soul in it. Everybody say soul. All right. So the body is the tent that we get to do life in. If you like yours, great. If you don't like yours, I don't know what to tell you. But it's just temporary. Then he says, Jesus is going to come and there's going to be the archangel with him. We know the archangel from Scripture to be Michael. Everybody say Michael. Now, listen, I'm breaking this down for you today because people don't teach on this anymore. And it's, we got to get to the Word and understand the Word because there's hope in this. And it's something very powerful that I want to lead you to. Now, Michael and Lucifer have locked horns in the past. No pun intended. In Daniel chapter 1, chapter 12, verse 1, Daniel is able to see from the Lord the end times. Here he says, at that time, Michael, the great prince who protects your people, will arise. There will be a time of distress 
such as has not happened from the beginning of nations until then. So in other words, Daniel's saying, Woo! It's gonna be bad. Now listen. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered. Everybody say delivered. Delivered. Jude verse 9. But even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, notice he was not disputing about the soul of Moses, but the body, did not dare to bring a slanderous accusation against, I think this is humorous a little bit, because Michael didn't even accuse Lucifer because he already knows Lucifer's end, because God is going to, in finality, cast Lucifer to outer darkness. Now, why is it important that the archangel come with Jesus? Because Lucifer was the archangel at one time. Now, listen, go with me to Revelation Chapter 12, verse 7. And there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. So in other words, rebellion, which is what happened, and we know the spirit of rebellion on our planet today. In fact, most of us us in this room have operated in the spirit of rebellion at some point in our life. The spirit of rebellion does not come from God. And while it is strong, it will not overcome the truth. And this gives me hope today because we are in a rebellious culture today. Listen, and the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was not strong enough to, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down. The ancient serpent called the devil or Satan who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him, kicked out of heaven and landed on earth and is leading the world astray. I want to say this to you right now. God will not lead you astray. God will not bring confusion in your life. He brings clarity in your life. And so you and I need to be aware of how the enemy operates It's to lead you astray. It's to lead you astray in your marriage. It's to lead you astray in your friendships. It's to lead you astray in your career. It's to bring chaos and confusion and strife and enmity in every way. So, back to 1 Thessalonians 4. i got to hurry. Paul says Jesus is going to come down from heaven with the archangel. And the archangel is going to give the command. Everybody say command. Now, why is this necessary? Because you need to understand that until the very end for Lucifer, and the very end is being cast into the lake of fire and outer darkness. Listen to me, church. Until the very end, Lucifer is going to fight with all strength and all power to overcome you, even at the moment that Jesus comes and the shout is given and the trumpet call goes out. Don't you think for one second that Michael is not there because Michael has already overcome Lucifer and it is going to be a reminder, let my people go. Let them go. What happens next? (laughs) Snatched up. Everybody say snatched. This sounds like a movie. What? I snatch. I snatch my food. (laughs) Have you ever watched a frog? Oh, they're fascinating. Just sit there and watch them sometimes. (laughs) That's snatched. That poor little bug ain't got no hope. And then the frog gets snatched by the snake. I kind of liken it to this. I don't share my food on my plate with people. Now, I've tried to overcome this issue that I have. But I'm like, that's my food. 
How many of you are food sharers? Please raise your hand high. Y'all are amazing. I'm talking about the food on your plate. I'm not talking about the food on the table. You can have all that you want, but what it's on my plate, it's about to be snatched. And if your finger gets close to it, it might get snatched too. That's how I like it. Mm. I always know, and I love, I love you, Laura. And we go to a restaurant, and she wants me to order something. And she's going to order something else, and we can share. I'm like... Because if I wanted the something else, I would have ordered it. I don't want it. I want all of that. It's mine. (laughs) Pastor JW, who used to be on staff at Church Alive, who's in Atlanta now, could eat faster than any human being I've ever seen in my life. He was in the Navy, and that's why he told me he had to eat fast. He would... I mean, I would barely be... I I like the journey. I like to savor the journey, but just don't touch my food. But that mug could eat fast. Snatched up. Matthew 24, verse 36. No one knows about the day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage up to the day that Noah entered the ark, and they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken. Whoop! I know somebody was right there. Snatched. Two women will be grinding at a hand mill. One will be taken, whoop, and the other left. There's biblical precedence for being snatched away, by the way. Enoch walked with the Lord, and then he was no more. Elijah, taken up, gone. Elijah really didn't like anybody, and he didn't like Elisha the most. And he didn't want him to be around him, but Elisha said, I need to see you go, and when you go, I need a double portion. So he stayed right with him, gone. Jesus snatched up. Jesus even said, I'm going to go. Acts chapter 1, go read it for yourself. We used to sing another song. This same Jesus that was taken shall return again one day. Anybody heard that one? Now, you are church of God if you've heard that song. Nobody's heard that song? I'll sing it for you one day. Uh, man, they would sing that song until everybody in the church was shouting to Jesus, for Jesus to return. And you would feel rapturous in that moment that Jesus was coming back that night. Jesus was snatched up. But that's not the end. There's going to be a reunion Everybody say reunion. Now, this is where my, I mean, how many of y'all like family reunions? How many of you don't? Oh, praise the Lord, I don't feel so slimy. I'm like, I don't know. I mean, I like family, but not all of them. Like, like when people go on family cruises, I'm like, oh, Jesus. Is it everybody? No, it's only a few. Hallelujah. But this reunion is going to be one that you don't want to miss. Like he said, he said that we will be caught up in the air to join those who have preceded us through falling asleep, will meet the Lord in the air and be with the the Lord forever. Now check this out. Here's the last thing I want to tell you. Here's what Paul says. Encourage each other with these words. Everybody say encourage. He said, open your mouth and encourage the person that's struggling, the person that's trying to overcome an addiction, the person that has... Uh, marriage issues, family crisis, can't get ahead in the career. I got to tell you today, we need to do a lot of encouraging. Because whatever you're at in life is not your final destination. And so in that process, I need to say I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you not to forget that Jesus is coming back. Now, in, in, in uh, the time uh, after Jesus was snatched up, a phrase was coined, and we should use it more today. It's called Maranatha. Everybody say Maranatha. 
when, when believers would encounter each other, I kind of like they had a little secret word, Maranatha. Do you know what they were saying? Jesus is coming back. Everybody say Maranatha. Maranatha. Jesus is coming. They would just, Maranatha. And they would say, Maranatha. Maranatha. Jesus is coming back. Now, fast forward from the time that Paul wrote this to now, there's been a whole lot of time go by. What happens to us humans? We get real impatient. And we move along and move on to other things. Other religions. Other philosophies. Other ideas. Other thoughts. Let me just go ahead and let you know they will never deliver. They will never deliver. But I'm telling you, Jesus is going to deliver. And he's coming back one day. And he's returning to take back those to be with him. Not to leave us here, but to take us back and be reunited as a family. Come on now. Reunited. Would you stand with me today? Can I get the band to come on out? I said, what did the pastor preach on today? It was like a, it was like Star Trek. Mm. I'm not so sure Star Trek is that far off base when it comes if you start studying Scripture. No, I don't think we're going to have clean on. Wait a minute, that's a different one. That's, no, that is Star Trek, isn't it? Thank you. I need to tap into my inner Star Trek. Would you bow your heads with me? You may be standing in this room today and you say, Pastor, I don't even know Jesus. I don't have a relationship with the Lord today. I need Jesus in my life. Nobody's looking around in this room. Well, no greater day than, than today for a miracle. Say, Pastor Glenn, I need my faith in the Lord. I need to trust in the Lord, and I need Christ to forgive me of my sins. Nobody's looking around. Would you slide your hand up in this room today? Anybody say, Pastor Glenn, that's me. I need Jesus in my life today. I'm going to hold just a second. Anybody at all? I need Christ in my life. I'm going to hold just a second. Today is a great day. With your heads bowed, how many of you say, Pastor Glenn? I sometimes cannot even think about the hope for tomorrow because of what I am dealing with today. Let me see your hand all over this room. Yes, 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 yes. And that can change any given day. Next week I could ask and others would raise their hand. How many of you would be honest though and say, I don't always live with an urgency for today? Let me see your hand. Yep. Look at me, church. You want to know why we don't live with an urgency for today? Because we in love with what we got. This is one of the great Lies and deceptions of the enemy. You got everything. You don't need, why you need God? You are God. Hmm? No, we don't say it that way, but we kind of live our life and operate it. That way, as I was driving through Fuquay today to get here, ominously, there was no traffic jam. It's the only time of the week, even that early in the morning, that there's not traffic. There was no traffic. And as I was driving through, I went through, this, through the uh, coffee shop to get coffee. And thought hit me. Sunday's just like every other day of the week for people. There's really nothing special about it anymore. It used to be that you couldn't wait to come together. Now, I actually like Sundays. It's my favorite day of the week, to be point blank honest with you. I don't sleep on uh, Saturday night. Uh, I do, but it's like Christmas Eve for me every Saturday night. I love it. I still like Christmas Eve, by the way. And uh, I'm like, I can't wait to get to church. I can't wait to be with with, uh, with family. I can't wait to worship together. I can't wait for the energy. That's how I approach Sunday. I'm being honest with you. But I'm like, you know what? Sunday's become every other day. Let's schedule this. Let's schedule that. Let's schedule. I literally remember. No, I'm older than some of you in the room, and I know you're going to think I'm crazy, but I remember when hardly anything was open on Sunday, except church. And if you wanted to eat... You had to wait till 3 o'clock in the afternoon for Grandma to finish up the fried chicken and mashed potatoes. I mean, it was, you would be in there trying to slip something because you were starving. But family came together. Oh, Pastor, that's, that'll never happen again. It probably won't. Because we're going somewhere. Nobody can really tell me where they're taking us, but we're going somewhere in our culture. We really ain't going somewhere. There's some things that are just best left alone. I tell my children that through the years they've wanted information. I'm like, mm-mm, what you don't know won't hurt you, won't kill you, won't help you. Just let it go. 
right? Just, how about, and then the Lord, and then I'm having like a, I almost went into judgment because that's what we do. See, all of us, I went, I'm telling you all these people out of my spirit. I'm like, God, no, no. And the Lord said, why don't you love and why don't you let, why don't you lead a church that changes the tide? Everybody say, change the tide. Kind of like what Clemson did last year in college football. Hallelujah. Change the tide. Scooter's not here right now. But please make sure he gets his podcast. Church needs to change the tide. Change the ebb and flow. The church ought to be, the church ought to be leading the culture, not being yanked by the culture. Let's be that. Let's be those people. Let's be that church. Let's be the miracle. Everybody say miracle. Can we give the Lord praise? Come on now. Hallelujah. So, what do we do with this? What do we do with it? We live with a hope for tomorrow with an urgency for today. Because tomorrow may never come for you in the sense of how you know it right now. It may not come for me in the sense that I know it right now. But to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. There won't be any of this soul going to go into some some cell, holding cell somewhere. And I've heard all this stuff. I'm like, until at some point somebody comes and releases. And you can still pray for the person that's in that holding cell that their soul will come to know Jesus. No, we're given a chance right now. We are given the opportunity right now to live for the Lord. Amen. In fact, even if that was true, I wouldn't want to risk it. Some things are not worth the risk. And that's one of them. I want to live right. I want to live according to His righteousness, not some church's righteousness or not some denominational. I want to live according to His righteousness. I want to love people. I really want to care about people. I want to care that someone's struggling or, or care that someone's uh, walking through a difficult time in their life. I want to be who Jesus says we need to be in that moment. How am I able to do that? That's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit helps me in my weakness. Lord, seal upon our hearts your word today. Let us be strong and courageous, full of your love, full of your strength, full of your power. Let us walk it out in Jesus' name. Amen.